Hi everyone, Dr. Mina here from The Skin Reel, and I'm really excited today to have a colleague of mine, Dr. Peter Leo, who is here to talk about not just medical and Western medicine for atopic dermatitis, but how we can integrate new therapies to help our patients with atopic dermatitis. And if you're wondering what the heck is atopic dermatitis, we will definitely be covering that as well. So Dr. Leo, thanks so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, so Dr. Leo is a clinical professor of dermatology at Mount Sinai as well as a clinical assistant professor of dermatology at Northwestern. He received his medical degree at Harvard, where he also did his dermatology training and was chief resident during his final year. And this is pretty cool. During your training in dermatology, you also received training in acupuncture, which I think is really, really awesome. Dr. Leo is a founding director of the Chicago Integrative Eczema Center and a founding partner of Medical Dermatology Associates of Chicago. He has over 200 publications. He has written three textbooks. I could go on and on, but let's just get into the meat of today's episode. Definitely. There's there's so much exciting stuff happening in the world of atopic dermatitis that I'm, I'm really glad we're talking about it right now. Yeah, well, let's get started. And what is atopic dermatitis for people who may not know? It, it's a really important question, and it's surprisingly slippery. It's not as clear as we'd like to think. But generally speaking, it is a chronic skin problem that is characterized by being itchy, by being recurrent or relapsing. You kind of get these flare-ups and maybe have periods where you're better. And it has a characteristic appearance or really appearances. You know, we kind of have a distribution and in a clinical appearance that is within a range. But that being said, as that sounds maybe kind of vague and encompassing a lot, it really does. This is a very heterogeneous disease, right? There's lots of different presentations. Some people have it on their hands predominantly. Other people have it on their face. Babies, of course, get it really badly on their cheeks. Sometimes it's red and scaly. Sometimes it's more open and oozing. Sometimes it's really dry and leathery, this lichenified process that we see. So it really is an incredible world unto itself. There's this great quote that I often start some of my presentations on atopic dermatitis with that, that basically in a nutshell says, who Whoever can take care of this condition has to be a master of all of dermatology because it really taxes us. It pushes us to our absolute limit. And you sort of have to be aware of every kind of pattern and every little trick and tip so that you can take the best care of this, this disease. Yeah, you are, you are so right. There are so many different presentations and severity. Uh, you know, some people outgrow it or they seem to outgrow it from childhood or when they're babies. And then you see other people who just are, are plagued with it for their entire life. So that is a, it is a very challenging uh, condition to treat and uh, definitely kudos to those medical dermatologists out there who are um, helping these patients. Would you say that eczema is a uh, synonym for atopic dermatitis, or do you make a distinction between the two? I think that by and large, it's used interchangeably. So eczema, you know, or atopic derm. But, you know, I think we can be a little bit more specific if we want. And I think of eczema as a little bit broader. It encompasses some other conditions as well, that one of which is atopic dermatitis, but other things can be eczematous, stasis dermatitis, allergic contact dermatitis, even seborrheic dermatitis to some degree. These can sort of fit in the eczematous eruptions, and then we can be a little bit more precise depending. But by and large, and I think popularly, we tend to just call it eczema. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so what are some of the mainstay treatments from a dermatologist perspective when you see these patients with atopic dermatitis? The first thing we're really trying to do is, is make sure we have the correct diagnosis because we know there are some things that can mimic it. Usually we don't have to go do a lot of blood tests or even a skin biopsy, anything like that, because generally speaking, we know, but we do have these cases where it seems it's actually more of an allergic contact dermatitis, something they're being exposed to in their home or their environment at work that is actually driving it. Uh, rarely, we can find things like foods or other environmental things that are actually explain what's going on, or at very least are triggers. So we're trying to, to figure out that part first 
once we have a pretty good grasp that there's, you know, we've done what we can do, we don't think there's anything obvious that's driving it, then we really start with the basics. Good education about what to expect. Uh, of course, gentle skincare in general. So we're going to be trying to use uh, gentle cleansers. We're going to try to use good moisturizers. And then really the big first step is going to be using an anti-inflammatory approach to cool things down. So typically we've picked topical corticosteroids because they've been with us since the 1950s. They were developed in, in really in the 50s and throughout the 60s being perfected. And the truth of the matter is they are far from perfect, but they work for most people. I would say, you know, good 95% of patients will respond to them and they're incredibly cheap and accessible. You can get them anywhere, no matter where you are in the world. So while they are far from perfect, they tend to be where we start and then we can kind of escalate the treatment from there. Yeah. Do you even use those on babies? We do. And I always say, you know, again, being more integrative minded, kind of looking for natural treatments, my patients usually come to me because they don't want to use a lot of medicine. And I say, listen, if I had my choice, I don't want to put medicine on anybody. Like I wish there was no disease. I want to be... <laughs> I, I want to be retired. I want to be sitting and relaxing, <laughs> reading a good book and everyone's taken care of, but that's not the way of the world, right? There is skin disease and there's skin diseases are ancient. I, I've written a couple of papers about the history of a, atopic dermatitis and eczema, and it goes back, I mean, depending on how you define it. And again, we said it's a little slippery, but you can actually find references to what I think really would constitute eczema in the Ebers papyrus, ancient Egyptian documents. So long wow. before there were preservatives and whatever we blame it on now, <laughs> right. and diesel fuel, which may play a role, mind you, but there, this has been with us for a long time. So I think we, we really try to, to do the best we can getting to the root of it. We try to, to do anything that's simple, but yes, I do use steroids in babies because the babies are suffering. And one thing we know is that the amount of suffering with this condition is enormous. And when they do these quality of life studies, they've been able to show that the impact on your quality of life, particularly with moderate or severe atopic dermatitis, is on par with and sometimes greater than things like diabetes and emphysema, wow. all this terrible stuff. So this is, you know, and it's a kind of an insult to injury because sometimes people who aren't experienced with maybe more severe cases are saying, wait a minute, it's just like a little skin thing. It's like a little itchy rash. Why is this a big deal? But for the patients and families who are suffering, it takes an incredible toll on them. Right. Yeah. And again, it, it's all about um, that heterogeneity of this condition. You know, for some people, it is a very mild rash. Um, but for others, it really can be devastating. And I think most listeners, and I know from speaking about myself, you know, when I get a rash, it's at minimum annoying. And a lot of times it can keep you up at night, you won't sleep. So I think sometimes we under, um, we underestimate the effect of, you know, just a rash on someone. And when it really is covering your whole body, it, it really can be devastating for people. So moving beyond topical steroids, which yes, of course, I think most people definitely would start there. What are some other treatments that you do? Again, not quite move into the integrative um, approaches yet. Perfect. So the conventional approach, you know, so we have our topical steroids tend to be our first line can be used safely, especially if we're using them for a little bit, taking a break, a little bit, taking a break. But if that's not enough, if we find that in addition to all of our good skincare, as we said, gentle bathing, good moisturizers, avoiding known triggers, if we feel either the steroids are not enough or much more commonly, they help, but people are sort of stuck in a loop. They're like, gosh, you know, everyone keeps saying, don't use them all the time. But as soon as I stop, I flare up again. So I'm only getting a day or two off per week at most, and I'm needing them all the time. That's a no-no. We're lucky now that we have some non-steroidal topical agents. So the one that's been with us the longest has been tacrolimus. And that originally came out in the year 2000. Uh, so can you believe it? 20, 23 years ago. No. <laughs> and then followed just after by its cousin, its first cousin, pimicrolimus, right? So those are two topicals that are non-steroidal and they can help a lot of people. Um, they're both generic now, which is great. So they should be more accessible, but I find sometimes they're still very expensive and difficult for patients to get. And they certainly don't work for everybody, but they can be helpful. And then of course we got in 2016, chrysoboral, a topical phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor that also brought with it a lot of promise. Very very, very safe. That one now is approved down to babies who are six months of age, which is really, really cool. Or pardon me, three months of age now, three months of age, which is really cool. So the youngest we really have uh, for this, which is amazing. And it's quite safe, but it doesn't work for everybody. It's sort of a modest in terms of its efficacy and it can sting and burn. 
for some patients. But then in just the last year or two, we've gotten another topical agent, um, which is really exciting, called topical ruxolitinib. And this is part of a family of, of compounds called JAK inhibitors or Janus kinase inhibitors. And this one's really powerful. I feel like this is the first non-steroidal that is honestly on par with a mid-potency steroid in terms of its rapidity of effect and its, and it's really its overall efficacy and pretty safe. Doesn't thin the skin, is truly not a steroid, but it does come with some potential warnings because this family of medicines can be immunosuppressive. And the issue here is that if you were to absorb enough, there could be some concern. So sometimes patients look at this, and there's actually a black box warning, as there is on tacrolimus mm -hmm. and pimercolimus as well, right. but it talks about things like blood clots and infection and all these things, and that can be a little bit off-putting. Yeah. And at moving on beyond topicals, what, what next? Are there things that people can take orally or injections for atopic dermatitis? So, right. So for like 50 plus years of modern medicine, we had essentially nothing. You know, people would use a lot of things off label. They would use prednisone or prednisolone, the systemic corticosteroids, which work great. But then it's, I always say it's a deal with the devil. Uh, for, for a number of patients, when you stop it, it comes back with a vengeance. You get this rebound flare and some people become dependent on it. And of course I'm biased because I get all of these poor patients who have been really hurt or, you know, messed up by these steroids. Other clinicians, even really seasoned ones, when I say, I've never had trouble. I give it to some patients with eczema, they're fine, but I still recommend against it. Most eczema experts will push against using those unless you're really backed into a corner. Somebody's mm -hmm. going to be traveling. Somebody has a wedding. You can use it in a pinch, but if you're finding yourself relying on systemic steroids, generally speaking, we think it's not a good idea. Uh, of course, people used other immunosuppressants off-label, cyclosporin, methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate, all of these things, but none of them are perfect. So right. the big breakthrough really happened in March of 2017 when we got our first FDA-approved systemic agent for atopic dermatitis in the United States, and that was with dupilumab, a biologic agent, an injectable agent. And it's really exciting because it's a monoclonal antibody that binds to this receptor, this IL-4 alpha receptor that plays a role in itch and inflammation and frankly, even skin changes, some of the, the deleterious changes that we see to the skin barrier. And I think we had great expectations for this medicine. We didn't quite know what to expect. And I have to say, I think it's really delivered quite nicely. And now that one's approved down to six month old babies, which is wow. really exciting. So it started out as adults, then it got adolescent, then little kids and six months old. So we now have that. And then in the last year, we've had two new big additions that also further enrich this toolbox. And those are the two new oral medicines that are part of that JAK inhibitor, Janus kinase inhibitor class, like the topical ruxolitinib, but these are pills. And those are upadacitinib and abracitinib. And these are really neat because they work super fast. Within, honestly, hours to days, we'll see improvement for patients, wow. which is crazy and incredible depth of effect. But the trade-off here is that they do have some potential safety issues and we have to do some monitoring of blood work and so on and so forth. But really everything has changed. And of course, now we have this pipeline of new agents that are being studied and then some of which we hope and expect to be released in the next couple of years. So it has gotten exponentially more complex. And people that are not super eczema nerds like me, I live in this world all the time, uh, they're kind of feeling overwhelmed. They're like, how do we use these things? When's the best time to use this? What is all this new stuff? We had nothing for all this time. And now we're kind of overwhelmed. It's a fire hose of potential. Yeah. Oh, hold on one second. My light went out. There we go. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, cause I graduated residency 10 years ago and we really did not have, you know, any of the, we had some of the biologics and things like that, but none of these new, uh, jack inhibitors and all of that. So it's really exciting, cool time. And it's really great for patients to finally have really good treatments beyond topical steroids or creams. Um, do you find these new medicines will suppress people's immune systems? So the cool thing is that some of these have the potential to, like those JAK inhibitors. Now, I would argue that they're not suppressing the immune system to the same degree as something like prednisone or cyclosporin or methotrexate, that they're more targeted, but they certainly do to some degree. But others, like the biologic agents, so we had our dupilumab, which started that. We have an, another cousin that came out shortly after called trelokinumab, and we have a third that should be released in the near future called lebrikizumab. And then even a fourth that's uh, a little bit, a little bit, for, you know, deeper in development, but not quite as close. And that one's called nemolizumab. All these, all these monoclonal antibodies, yeah. they really do not seem to be immunosuppressants. And you know, there's a number of ways. Sometimes patients will challenge me and say, "Why do you keep saying that? You know, it's shutting off this inflammation. So isn't it? Doesn't that mean it's an immunosuppressant?" Mm -hmm. I would say two things. First of all, they're so targeted that they're really only picking on one specific aspect of really the allergy side of the immune system. So when we say immunosuppressant, we're thinking about broad. Right. 
you know, broad spectrum things that can affect our ability to fight bacteria and viruses, but these don't seem to do it. Number two, though, the proof in the pudding that I love is that with at least dupilumab and I think with trilokinumab as well, we see that the number of skin infections for patients on the medicine are actually lower. So wow. it seems to have the effect that we really want. We want to see a decrease in infections. Whereas in theory, if you were going to suppress someone's immune system, the risk of serious infection seems to go up. Right. And and I we know that bacteria on the skin can also just being colonized with bacteria can make these conditions worse. So that's that's really cool. And you know, at least I'm I'm more focused on skin cancers and just there's been an explosion in the world of melanomas and non-melanoma skin cancers with these um with these more targeted therapies. And it's really awesome to see that with atopic dermatitis as well. Finally. <laughs> exactly. Now, so when patients come to see you, I'm sure you you go over all of these things, you sort of find the right medication for them. But are there ever times where you maybe would forego these sort of traditional medicines and just start more with integrative? Or do you sort of find that they pair nicely together? So uh, yes, I, I really kind of feel out the situation because some patients come to see me particularly or exclusively for a more integrative approach. Others just don't want to deal with that and really want just more medicine. They're like, can you get, just get me better? And the <laughs> third group is like, do whatever you want. We're, we're in. Um, so I, I only see referred patients in now. So I have a I have a pretty interesting clinic. Everybody is tough by definition. Everybody has tried things. And it's nice because they're often extremely educated. Many patients come in with papers and you know documents and they know a lot. So it's kind of fascinating. Um, and I do think in general, eczema patients are pretty smart. They're like a very, very focused group of patients who are thinking about their skin and wondering about it. And it's kind of cool. And in some, some other skin conditions, I feel like patients maybe are a little bit more like, eh, I don't know, it's a bump on my back. I didn't think much about it. What do you think, doc? And I feel like my skin cancer patients are often caught off guard with mm -hmm. this because it's torturing them consistently. Right. They've learned about it. It's sort of, it's a nemesis that they understand and are thinking about and asking questions. So it's really a unique interaction. I've had just the most wonderful I've formed all these bonds with my patients over the years. So we have these wonderful relationships and that's a big part of it for me. But yeah, so I'd ask them kind of where they're at or we explore that a little bit. And the most common thing I do is, is both. I really try to integrate the best of conventional or Western medicine treatments. And I use all the things we talked about all the time, mm -hmm. sometimes shocking to patients. Like I thought you were integrative. I'm like, mm, I don't know <laughs> if that's what that means. I'm not alternative, right? Alternative right. might mean instead of conventional can, right. I'm just going to use something, but I'm integrative. So I'm pulling from both. And, but I also love botanicals. I'm a big fan of coconut oil. I'm a big fan of sunflower oil. I use a lot of vitamin B12 topically. There's this topical okay. preparation we call pink magic, uh, that has an effect. I love thinking about diet and lifestyle changes holistically. How can we, how can we use these and, and sort of leverage them to get patients better? And, and sometimes part of what I do is dispelling things. You know, a lot of my patients say, well, we're gluten and dairy free and we've been doing that for six months. It's not helping, but we know this is the right thing. And I'm like, is it the right thing? Are we sure it's the right thing? What's the evidence say about that? So we can explore those things. And sometimes we'll go away from things that I think are not helping or even potentially dangerous mm -hmm. uh, and towards things that I think may have some evidence to help. But by definition, of course, it's not going to be to the same level of evidence as an FDA approved drug. I mean, the whole purpose of the FDA, if we look at its history, and sometimes they're the bane of our existence, right? We're like, right. FDA always getting involved, but they play an important role they were built at a time when people were literally selling snake oil. I mean, that was what it was all about, <laughs> literal snake oil. I mean, you know, the whole concept of this. And the FDA was like, we need we need a group to help people figure out what's true and false. You know, it's one thing to say, let the market decide. But when it's your health, you don't want to be the person who helps decide that this was actually a poison, you know, and you're dead. Right. Well, we got to shut this company down, but these 10 people are, it's like, can we, we got to catch it before this happens. So there right. are limitations on this. And that's the purpose of the FDA, you know, in the best of light. So tell me more about the botanicals. So how do you recommend patients use, did you say co uh, coconut oil and the B12? Do you, do you have them use it as kind of a moisturizer, an emollient? So all the above, definitely. So I, you know, we use a lot of different things. I probably have 30 or 40 different integrative tools in my toolbox that I pull a lot, you know, different things that I pull a lot, depending on the patient, the context, the body location, the age of the patient. So I kind of have stuff I'll do for babies more, stuff I'll do for older patients, uh, stuff I'll do for hand eczema, eyelid dermatitis, a whole, that's a whole chapter in the textbook of my life, mm -hmm. a lot of eyelid and facial issues. So depending, but yes, and coconut oil, for example, is something I really like because it contains this chemical class called monolaurins that are antibacterial. 
and they're antibacterial in a way that is very, very good against staphylococcus and not so hard on the rest of your microbiome. So it's sort of years and years before people started thinking about microbiome friendly manipulation. Mother Nature figured this out. Coconut yeah. oil really can help. Now, that doesn't mean there's no potential side effects. People can be allergic to coconut yeah. oil. It's real. Uh, it's just fortunately pretty rare. But that being said, I do like it. And so typically the way I'll use a natural oil is after a bathing, they can put their oil on first. It tends to be absorbed very quickly. It does its job. And then they can put their conventional medicine, maybe even a topical steroid, maybe a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, and then a good moisturizer to lock everything down. There's been some interesting discussion in our crazy niche corner of the literature about the order of operations. Is uh -huh. it better to put a medicine on and then a moisturizer, which has been most guidelines tend to go with that. And most, when you look most clinical trials, that's how they're performed. But more recently, there's some discussion that maybe it's better to put a moisturizer on first and then the medicine, because one of the things that happens when you put moisturizer over medicine, depending on the vehicles, this is the other problem. There's so many different things out right. there depending on what else is in there, but it can actually smear and diffuse the medicine such that you're treating a larger area than you want and potentially diluting it a little bit over, right. over a larger area. But I think there's, again, this may, your mileage may vary and we have to really look carefully at the patient, the scenario and the particular types of products we're using and recommending. Yeah, yeah, totally. What besides topicals, what are some other integrative approaches that you use in this complex group of patients? There are a lot of things. So one of the things that kind of stands is kind of straddles the line or stands betwixt and between these two worlds is phototherapy. So I'm a big fan. You know, I, we trained, you know, at mm -hmm. Mass General where there, the phototherapy movement really began and was taken off. It's a fabulous, fabulous uh, therapeutic modality. And I think it's really underutilized for atopic dermatitis. I think in my hands, it helps on the order of 75 or 80% of these really bad situations these patients are in. And it does so in a very holistic, natural way. Vitamin D is anti-itch, anti inflammatory it boosts your vitamin D, it's antibacterial, you know, it's amazing. And there's a behavioral piece too, because I think when patients go in, they get contact and support and, mm -hmm. you know, cheerleading. So I think they're much more likely to do better. So I, that's one of the things I use a lot of. Another thing in terms of supplements, there's some data that hemp seed oil, taking oral hemp seed oil actually may help strengthen the skin barrier and have an anti-inflammatory effect. So I use that sometimes. There's a wonderful paper about it. There's another paper that's called Feeding Filagrin that talks about using uh, an amino acid supplement called okay. L-histidine that seems to push the filagrin pathway forward. So it turns out a big breakthrough happened about eh, now 15 years ago or so. The understanding that the filagrin protein encoded by FLG, right? The gene is FLG. When you have a mutation in this, and a lot of people do, you're much more likely to have dry skin and itchy skin and much more likely to have atopic dermatitis or eczema. So one thought is, can we help these people heal their skin barrier? And it turns out that taking L-histidine by mouth, not to be confused with histamine, it sounds kind of like <laughs> yeah. it's just histidine is this amino acid. You take this and it actually can help bolster your skin barrier. Now, the data is very sparse. This might be proven false later, but at least the one really nice study, they did a, an in vitro part, they actually were able to show it in the lab, but then they also did a clinical trial and were able to show improvement. So these are some of the tools in my toolbox that I will use, again, often in accordance with other different conventional therapies that we've talked about. Right. And what about things like acupuncture? Do you use that with atopic dermatitis? I sure do. So when I finished residency, I spent uh, really another year studying acupuncture for physicians under Kiko Matsumoto and David Euler. It was actually a wonderful, wonderful course that was hosted by Harvard. It was a, it was a Harvard sponsored uh, course for physicians. And I was the only dermatologist there, the first one who ever did it. Since then, others have gone through, which is really neat. Yeah. And we spent a year learning about acupuncture and acupressure and this approach to medicine. It was incredibly eye-opening. To me, it was sort of a revelation in thinking about health and disease. It, it really challenged everything we had learned in medical school and, and looked at the body from a totally different way. Uh, of course, uh, the joke if for Harvard medical students is we only get a few weeks of anatomy, and this was all about anatomy. <laughs> Suddenly, we were immersed in thinking about all the different, not only the, the traditional Chinese anatomy in terms of thinking about meridians, but even just thinking about the fascial planes of the body and even the names of the muscles, just knowing where these points are and how it all comes together. Amazing. So yes, we found that 
that you can actually affect itch in particular using acupuncture and acupressure. And we wrote a study about it a few years ago where we had patients just pick one point called large intestine 11. It's sort of near, near the crux of the elbow uh, on the outer part of the arm. And we were able to show that there was a significant difference for patients who use this acupressure point. And that's pretty amazing, you know, to think about it. It costs nothing. The risks are essentially zero. I guess you could sprain your finger if you push too hard. <laughs> acupressure, they could affect their itch. And that was, to me, again, another revelation. Wow, that is so cool. I I know just from knowing people who struggle with itch from a, a number of not just skin conditions, malignancies, it it can be um, just devastating when you cannot stop scratching and you just have you're in this terrible cycle of of itch, scratch, itch, scratch. So being able to have something like acupuncture actually help that is really remarkable. That's amazing. Do you do that in your clinic? Do you have, do you do it yourself or have someone who does it? I, I do some myself, but mostly I do refer out because okay. I do find that to do it right, especially for patients that have more complex things going on, a really good acupuncturist is what you need. And I am not a really good acupuncturist. I am like a medical student version of an acupuncturist. You know, I only had a little bit of training, so I know enough to be dangerous. But for some of these these simpler concepts, like to find a pressure point is really yeah. great. And we do that, and especially I find teenagers respond very well to that. They say, this is really good. I like this. This helps me. It's very safe. And, and I've had, you know, sort of detractors and sort of maybe even haters, you might say, say, well, it's just placebo. That's okay. But you know what? Placebo does have benefits. It helps my patients. And we're not, you know, no one's cheating anybody. You're not stealing anything. And you're very open. You say, listen, we did a small study and seemed to help some people. We don't know how it works. Let's try it. Now, is that something that is covered by insurance or do people usually have to pay out of pocket? Typically, acupuncture comes out of pocket. So when I do it, I'm not billing for it at all. I mean, this is just part of my my visit stuff. But but right, if they go see an acupuncturist, they do it out of yeah. pocket. Now, I tend to refer to an acupuncturist in the Chicago area who's fantastic, and he does a Japanese communal style acupuncture. So it's much much cheaper. Okay. Uh, typically, he charges people on the order of like twenty to fifty dollars per session, which is really copay range for mm-hmm. us. If you think about it, and the trade off is that you're in a small room with several different people at once, so you're all kind of getting your treatment. <laughs> in real time and it's a little more communal but uh it's very very nice as opposed to it doesn't feel like a spa or you know you're not you're by yourself but those can sometimes be 150 200 or more for patients and then it's hard to do many sessions even if you're wealthy it's you know if you're blessed to have money to do it even then it's still like gosh how do i keep doing this on and on and on whereas if it's maybe 20 to 50 dollars you could say okay i'm going to do it for the month or two as we're discussing and i think more patients can get through it obviously i wish we had it freely available to everybody, but that's, yeah. that's not going to happen. I think uh, in the U S for a while, we have other, other bigger healthcare problems that <laughs> exactly, um, first. but that's really cool. I, I've never heard of the communal acupuncture, but I, I would totally get on board with that. <laughs> what are, are some other therapies that maybe we haven't mentioned? Are there any others that you like to use? Some of the things I really like, I think that behavioral therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful for a lot of people. I think the key thing is you have to couch it correctly. And I always tell my patients, I'm like, listen, I'm not saying you're crazy. I'm not saying this is in your head. It's it's not like, it's really not, you know, it's not even, even the secret behind the scenes is is not, but Mm -hmm. it takes a huge toll on people. It's a hard disease to deal with. And there's a terrible circuit, the stress cycle that when you're feeling stressed, when you're, you mentioned it early on, when you're not sleeping well, all of this has a very direct effect in our immune system and our skin barrier and in our mental state. So you get this loop. And I think sometimes things like behavioral therapy, hypnosis, I use a lot of hypnotherapy. I have a wonderful hypnotherapist that I work with here in Chicago um, that is fantastic. So we can really leverage some of these things. And again, I don't think this is going to solve everybody's problem 100%. And for some people, it's not a good fit. But a fair number of times people say, wow, this made a big difference. And I feel like now I'm in a better place than I was a few months ago before we started this. And that's a huge deal. Yeah, um, totally. It's 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 great that nowadays where people are finding that these things are interconnected. It's not like you can just treat the skin condition or just treat the heart or just treat diabetes. It's all all connected, and and this complementary uh, treatments and medicine is is really key. So it's it's great to see how far things have come, even since we finished our training. I'll say, right? I mean, I think this this push on being a little bit more holistic is generally speaking a really good thing. And obviously, you know, we're not trying to fool ourselves. We still have to be very respectful of of scientific progress. And, you know, I'm not 
here to to question stuff that I think works. And that's really, I think, our goal is to be holistic, to think broadly, and to solve problems. I often say that really good clinicians, no matter where we were in history at any point, they do this naturally. They have to think out of the box. The reason I got so excited about integrative approaches and alternative medicines is because I felt stuck. I couldn't help my patients to the way I wanted to. So I said, there has to be another way. And I was willing to, and still am, I still learn. I still get, you know, I still get, uh, learned and educated uh, frequently by patients where they don't respond or I can't get them better or we can't figure this out. So I feel like part of the excitement of the journey is to keep learning with the patient and trying new things and watching our, our intellect and understanding and experience grow. And that's the only way we move forward. Otherwise, I, I always tell the story. I had a teacher that I loved who was really an evidence-based guru. He was excellent, super smart. Um, patients came from all over to see him. And once as a resident, I went in and talked to the patient first and she was tearful. Uh, and she had, uh, lichen, she had a lichen planus uh, disseminated type, very bad, including in the mouth. And she said, I've been waiting so long for this appointment. I've been miserable. No one can help me. And I told my attending, I said, what are we, what are we going to do? What do we got? And he walked in and he looked her in the face and said, we have nothing for you. There's no evidence-based medicine. I wish you luck. And he left the room. And I'm standing there with this poor patient. She just broke down and started sobbing. And in that moment, I knew I'm like, that's not right. I don't think that's the right way. I don't want to be that. Right. Um, I get it. I get it. And maybe you could say, you know, if you are by the letter of the law, if we don't have evidence-based things, you're not going to do anything. But I'm like, that's, I don't want to be that. I'm not a technician. I'm not a lab technician. I'm a doctor. And part of that means taking care of the patient. And sometimes that means going on a journey with the patient, even when we don't know where we're going, right? We have to go into the unexplored. Otherwise, do we just give up? Do we just right. say we're waiting for drug companies to make the next big thing? How are they going to learn? How is anybody going to learn? So I really feel that it's part of my, it's been my DNA to say we need to think outside of the box and we'll do what it takes to get you better. That my desire to help you is far greater than my ego. I'm happy to be wrong. I want to be wrong sometimes. I want to keep learning. That's the only way we're going to move forward. Yeah, that that's so great. You know, evidence-based medicine has such an important role, but you're right. Not everything has the evidence yet. And what are we going to do? Just say, sorry, can't help you? Or, or are we going to actually try try things. And I think as long as the patient knows, hey, we're we're in this together. I'm here with you. We'll try these things. We'll see what works. And, um, you know, we're, as long as it's not harmful or unsafe, why not give it a chance, right? The, absolutely. To be a shepherd through the journey is part of our job. And I will say that, you know, one of the hardest parts that I deal with is diet because so many patients come in and they are focused on the diet. And many yeah. patients sometimes are mad at the end of the visit. You know, we spend a long time on beads of sweat. We've gone over everything. I made them an action plan. We do all this stuff. And they say, wait, you didn't mention diet. Why not? And the truth is, it's like Sutton's law. Sutton was the bank robber, right? Why do you rob banks? That's where the money is. Why don't you talk about diet? Because usually that's not where the money is. In my experience, most of my patients, they've tried a million diet things. And that's why they're seeing me. Now, is it possible that there are patients out there for whom diet has been transformative and changed their life? Yes, I'm sure. And I think there probably are. God bless them. I wish them all the best. They don't need me. They don't need this, right? If, if it, it turned out cutting out strawberries or gluten or dairy cured you, great. Have a great right. life. But we're dealing with the people for whom that didn't work. Everybody told them to do that and that didn't. Now, what is the danger of playing with diet? So we used to maybe say for, especially for adults, okay, if you want to try doing some exclusion, you can try it. Most patients, not zero. There are patients for whom it makes a difference for real, but most patients in this situation don't do very well with that. It doesn't seem to help. Might help a little. The classic thing here is I was a little better, but mm -hmm. it wasn't gone. But what is the danger? Well, Anne Marie Singh up in Wisconsin did this beautiful study where she was able to show that patients who were known to be not truly allergic, tested negative to true allergy, right? Because that's the other piece that's confusing and conflated oftentimes is a food allergy, which is way higher in our eczema patients. And now we have this interesting narrative that maybe the reason we see so much food allergy in our patients with eczema is because they have leaky skin, damaged skin, and the food proteins are able to get mm -hmm. in and sensitize them. Mm -hmm. So that may be what's going on. But of course, food allergy in this context, true food allergy is IgE mediated. And the symptoms are very different than atopic dermatitis or eczema. This is you eat a peanut and your lips blow up and your eyes yeah. swell shut and you have hives, right? And wheezing, very important not to be trifled with by any stretch. But patients who were clearly de didn't have that, they were tolerating the food, they maybe even okay. tested negative. They said, but I think it could be, for example, let's say gluten. I think it's gluten. Everyone keeps telling me cut gluten. So they cut gluten. Fine. When they added it back to oftentimes to see if it gets worse or whatnot, a percentage of them now became truly allergic to gluten. 
oh, like wow. really allergic. Some of them had anaphylaxis and the same went for dairy or eggs or a lot of these different things. So what we find is that one good way to make yourself allergic to a food is to stop eating it because right. it turns out that we become tolerant to those foods by eating them. The gut is playing an important role telling our body, hey, settle out. This is nutrition. Quit quit messing around. And it turns out that's why there's this push to get little kids eating peanuts, which is the yeah. antithesis of what we were right. telling people 10 years ago. We were saying, wait, right. don't feed the kid peanuts. Wait till they're older, till they're more yeah. m- mature, some baloney. But it was that was wrong. It was backwards. That's how you make an epidemic of peanuts. Right. Now we're saying give the babies peanut snacks because we want them to toler- become tolerant or tolerize mm-hmm. to these foods. So this is kind of the thing we have to go through. But obviously, this is complicated. And the truth right. is, we don't know all the answers. I can't predict with 100% on any of this stuff. So sometimes you can really lose a patient's faith if you say something that they they don't they don't jive with. So I think a big piece of our of our job is to say this is what we know, this is the best we can do right now and we we have to be open to continuing to learn because this is a story that has not yet been fully written. Yeah, uh, totally. And y- the your point about the food food allergy or restricting your diet with food, it's so important with kids that they eat a balanced diet and we don't we really don't want to be restricting what they can eat, especially if it's not helping their skin condition and potentially could then cause them to have an allergy. So making sure with kids that we're not giving them an overly restrictive diet is is really important. So uh, that's really interesting. I know with my children, I was giving them peanuts as soon as I could because I did not want them to have a, a peanut allergy. So it is interesting how these things change. And again, medicine, is there's an art form to it. And it, it changes and our knowledge changes and what we know now will vary when, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. So it's, uh, it's not black and white. So what's the Schopenhauer quote, every problem passes through three stages on the way to acceptance. First, it appears laughable. Second, it is fought against. And third, it is considered self-evident, right? <laughs> or we're sometimes in the laughable phase where people say, that's silly. And now I think we're saying, oh yeah, everybody knew that. Right. Exactly. So true. So true. Well, this has been really informative. Can you maybe send us off with three pearls or tips you would give to someone who is struggling with atopic dermatitis and what they can do? I think a couple things. Sure. So first tip is try to find a moisturizer that you like that feels good to your skin. Ideally one that has something like the National Eczema Association seal of acceptance. Um, I am biased because I'm a board member for the NEA, but I don't get paid by them. I donate a lot of money and I love this nonprofit group that really tries to, to help patients and families and do a lot of different support aspects. But they have a seal program that helps us know what which ones are more likely to be helpful for eczema patients. Obviously, it can't do everything. We don't know everything. But uh, finding a good moisturizer and using it regularly and frequently two, three, four times a day. Many of my patients tell me that when they up their moisturizer use, they're like, boy, it really does feel a lot better. The second thing I will ask patients to do is to consider the most gentle kind of bathing. And one of my favorite tips for bathing is people say, I just use pure water, but even just water actually can strip away some of the oils. So one of the things I really like is using cleansers that are oil-based. And many companies have them. Typically, they use something like castor oil and uh, or soybean oil, some of these are. And they're very, very soothing and nice. And what I find is that they really sort of help replenish some of the natural oils in the skin without being too aggressive in terms of removing it. Some people will use like Castile soap and things like that. And I think even though they're kind of simpler or more natural, they still can do more stripping and they have a very alkaline or very uh, base uh-huh. pH. This, this alkaline pH is not so good for our skin. We want to keep it acidic. Um, and then the third thing I would say that's really powerful is finding practitioners that really resonate with you. And if you're feeling like you're not making progress with somebody, it's really important to look around and find someone with, with whom you really have a good connection. Because at the end of the day, I have thousands and thousands of eczema patients. And truth be told, I have thousands and thousands of different approaches to it. Everybody's is honestly a little bit different. And I don't say that just to, to do the old canard that every individual is a snowflake, but they really are. They really are different. And so I start often with a pretty similar approach for most people. But by the time we're done, it changes. I didn't care for that 
that cream. That one stung and burned. I didn't like the supplement. It made me feel gassy. Okay, fine. Yeah. We're going to change things around. And so I really am trying to find different stuff that works. And the truth is, it's not even necessarily that sophisticated. It's like, this is kind of the thing I think will help with your skin barrier. But if that doesn't work, here's another thing. And we can try those together. So being go, being willing to go on that journey and, and to know the things that work and being honest with ourselves with things that don't work, I think is really the secret to getting patients better. And I'm happy to say that I'm able to get most of my patients a lot better. Not all. I wish I could say I got everybody better, mm -hmm. but I really can get a vast majority improved. And some of them so great that, you know, we find that they don't need medicines anymore. And that's my favorite wow. moment when they say, I haven't had a flare up. I really don't think I need it. I don't need refills. And I'm like, you did it. Yeah. Hi, call me if you need me. I'll see you at the supermarket. You know, this is fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a, a great feeling when you can help a patient with these chronic conditions and, and they don't need any medicine. Um, so that's, that's gotta be a great feeling for you. Well, I really appreciate your time today. Where can our listeners uh, reach you if they want to get in touch? The best place. Um, if you go to Chicago eczema, Dot com. That's my main website for the eczema center, the Chicago Integrative Eczema Center, chicagoeczema.com, or my practice, which is uh, dermchicago.com. And that's our, our main office number, but you can reach us there and set up appointments if you wish. And I always post all my educational stuff uh, online. Awesome. Well, I will definitely put that in the show notes. And I really appreciate your time here today, Dr. Leo. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Take care.